A deafening crash shattered the pre-dawn silence of Amherst, Ohio on March 29, 1916. Metal shrieked, wood splintered, and the town jolted awake. Moments later, another explosion ripped through the air, followed by the chilling hiss of steam and terrified screams. The thick fog choked the town, heavy with the unspoken fear of what had just transpired. The peaceful night had morphed into a nightmare and the townspeople knew their lives would never be the same. Amherst embodied the idyllic American small town. Its brick storefronts line Main Street, echoes of laughter ring from each home's open windows, and children chase lightning bugs in the twilight. And within this peaceful facade lies a web of steel tracks carrying the lifeblood of a nation. It was here on a fateful March night that a silent, unseen storm gathered amidst the calm and a horrific collision shattered the town's serenity, forever altering its history. Today we take a look at the Amherst train wreck of 1916, a tragedy that would claim 27 lives and injure 47 more, and lead to stricter rail regulations and procedures. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. Along the town of Amherst, the East-West Railroad, known in 1916 as the Toledo Division of the New York Central Railroad, had three tracks running side by side by side. These tracks are numbered 3, 2, and 1, with the northernmost track, number 3, used by westbound trains headed toward Toledo. The middle track, 2, by high-speed eastbound trains headed toward Cleveland, and the number 1 southernmost track by slower eastbound trains. In 1916, the movement of the trains on these rails were governed by a timetable and a block signal system mounted on bracket poles. Today, rail interlocking signals can be as easy as red light, green light. But back then, articulated arms at various angles alerted train engineers as to the condition of the rails ahead and if it was safe to proceed at their current pace. Now, I'm no expert in train signal systems from 1916, so if you have a better understanding of how these signals worked, please leave a comment below. This system of indicators was easy to see and worked well during normal weather conditions. But on March 29, 1916, a dense fog cloaked the town of Amherst in an eerie white blanket that would become a silent accomplice to tragedy. Train number 86, heading from Chicago, Illinois to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, was split into two separate trains that night due to heavy rail traffic. So the second number 86 was commissioned to run several minutes behind the first. The first number 86, drawn by locomotive 4871, pulled a wooden baggage car, steel postal car, six steel Pullman cars, a steel underframe club car, and an all-steel coach. Conductor Frank Bunnell was in charge, and engineer D.W. Leonard was at the throttle. It left Toledo at 1.43 a.m., eight minutes behind schedule. By the time it reached the last open telegraph office in Vermilion, Ohio, it was 3.03 a.m., and was only one minute behind schedule. The second number 86, drawn by locomotive 4881, pulled five steel Pullmans, three wooden coaches, four wooden baggage cars, and one steel underframe express car. John Keller was the conductor on this train, and the engineer's last name was Hess. But four different first names, Herbert, Herman, John, and Martin, turned up in newspapers. It left Toledo at 1.56 a.m., 13 minutes behind the first number 86. By the time it reached Vermillion, it was 3.09 a.m., and had closed the gap between itself and the first 86, to only six minutes. Meanwhile, train number 25, known as the 20th Century Limited, left Cleveland at 2.34 a.m., heading west toward Chicago and was running four minutes late. It was drawn by locomotive 4813 and was pulling an all-steel club car, six steel Pullmans, and an all-steel observation car. C.C. Robinson was the engineer and M.V. Burke was the conductor. 
these three trains were unknowingly about to converge in the little town of Amherst. As the first number 86 reached Amherst, it found a town shrouded in dense fog. Engineer Leonard soon came upon Amherst Tower distance signal S-72 in the caution position. He slowed the train and then stopped slightly west of North Lake Street at interlocking signal 40 due to that signal being in the stop position. All the while, the second number 86 continued eastward at 50 miles per hour, unaware that the first number 86 had come to a complete stop. The time was 3.13 a.m. The trains were now only five minutes apart and closing. The first 86 flagman hopped off the train, lit a red flare, and started for the back of the train to alert the second train. Engineer Leonard blew the whistle and the signal cleared. The flagman didn't even have time to reach the back of the train, so he climbed back aboard. The engine slipped and stalled. The flagman again got off. This time, he heard the second section of 86 approaching. It sounded like it was using steam and was about a mile away. He ran for the rear of the train with a lantern and a red flare. Engineer Leonard backed up the locomotive to put slack between the cars and quickly get it moving again. Vital moments lost as the second number 86 suddenly appeared through the fog. Unaware of the danger, the second number 86 carrying over 200 passengers barreled into the first at full speed. The Goliath engine slammed into the steel coach of the first train with such impact that it raised the back end of the car and rammed it forward under the back of the club car. The club car was forced at right angles across the paralleled westbound track. The impact was a horrific symphony of metal tearing and screams echoing in the stillness of the early morning. Some survivors from the wreck immediately went into action, fumbling their way through the darkness and the mud searching for the injured. Others just stood along the tracks in utter disbelief as they gazed through the flames upon the mass of twisted steel. But the horror wasn't over. The mangled wreckage spilled directly in the path of the westbound 20th Century Limited, speeding towards Chicago. Number 25 was working steam when it came barreling out of the fog down the westbound track at 70 miles an hour. Leonard blew his whistle, but engineer Robertson didn't see the wreckage on the track in front of him. His massive locomotive nearly cut the club car in half, pushing one end of it into the steel coach and destroying it. The engine rolled over on its side and continued sliding down the roadbed for approximately 700 feet, striking and overturning several of 86's cars that were in its path. The collision was far more devastating than the first, pulverizing both trains and leaving a scene of utter carnage. Only the locomotive and the first seven cars of the first number 86 and the last two cars of the second number 86 remained on the rails. The track was torn up for a hundred yards and a massive amount of debris was scattered for half a mile. The small town of Amherst was suddenly awakened from their dreams and thrust into a nightmare. Mayor Foster was quick to arrive at the scene. Once he saw the severity of the wreckage, he hurried to town hall and rang the bell to summon help. The town's firemen, railroad workers, and farmers who lived in the area were the first to respond. They battled the darkness and smoke desperately searching for survivors amidst the mangled wreckage. It was a gory scene of injured and dead, some of them still adhering to number 25's engine. Corpses were strewn along the track like rag dolls, and rescuers found it almost impossible to free victims who were pinned under the wreckage. An hour and a half later, six doctors arrived, but there was little they could do except try to alleviate the victim's pain. It took six hours to recover the injured and dead. Victims were loaded onto the undamaged sleeper cars of the first number 86 and hurried east to the train depot where they were loaded into waiting ambulances and rushed into town. The hospital in Amherst was under construction at the time and wouldn't be completed until the following year. So 16 victims were taken to Elyria Memorial Hospital where they were lined up in the corridors waiting their turn to be treated in the triage of what resembled a slaughterhouse. More victims were taken to St. Joseph Hospital in Lorraine, and at least two of them died there. In all, 27 people were dead, 
but only 14 were immediately identified. The rest were either mutilated beyond recognition or reduced to only singular body parts. Meanwhile, amidst the chaos, stories of heroism and resilience began to emerge. Notable among those who were traveling westbound on the 20th Century Limited was silent film star Mary Pigford. Mary had just completed filming the movie Holda from Holland and was traveling from upstate New York to Los Angeles with her understudy Ella Hall. When the first batch of injured were loaded onto the sleepers of the first number 86, Pickford and Hall refused to go. They stayed at the wreckage site and helped render first aid to the remaining injured. Mary Pickford, known as America's sweetheart, an actress who in her day was a bigger Hollywood name than any actor since, was one of the last people to leave the scene, making sure that those in need were first taken away for help. There was also a report that Mary Marston, an Indianapolis woman who was riding in the second section of number 86, gave birth moments after the collision. She and her baby were taken to the Illyria Memorial Hospital where doctors said both would be fine. Back at the wreck site, all three tracks were blocked, forcing the railroad to reroute other east and westbound trains. The rails on the high-speed track were bowed and contorted, and the road was torn up for nearly 500 yards. It took two hours for wreckers to free up the northern track so that westbound traffic could resume. The other two tracks were cleared by the next evening. The gruesome task of identifying the victims fell to coroner Charles Garver. 22 bodies were lying in the Amherst Furniture Store and Funeral Parlor owned by O.H. Baker. And one report claimed there were four stretchers with nothing but bloody body parts. Garver did his best to match arms, legs, and even heads to bodies. A young boy named Harold Grant identified his father, Dr. J.C. Grant, by a ring taken from the hand of one of the dead. The victim's body was so badly battered that it was unrecognizable. Another corpse was identified by a receipt in a coat pocket and bowling ball and a monogrammed handkerchief helped to put a name to another. The New York Central Railroad Company contracted with a monument firm and had five headstones placed in Crown Hill Cemetery for the unknown victims of the wreck. They are inscribed with how they met their fate, but the names were left blank should any further remains be identified. As was the case with the Ashtabula train wreck 40 years earlier, looters began filching the injured victims' pockets and stealing valuables from the dead. Survivors claimed to have lost anywhere from $2,500 to $3,000 in cash and valuables. And police arrested one man for taking a scalp from one of the corpses. Apparently, he took it home and put it in a jar of alcohol. Unbelievable. There is a healthy amount of controversy regarding the signals that caused the first number 86 to slow and then eventually stop. Amherst Towerman, Albert Ernst, was interviewed by the Interstate Commerce Commission and gave a detailed account of his actions that morning. Ernst said he was reading at his desk when the annunciator sounded for the first 86 at 3.10 a.m. He went to his interlocking machine, saw that track indicator 40 was clear, meaning the track was clear for the train to continue eastbound, so he pulled lever 40 over to clear the signal. Again, looked at his indicators and verified that signal 40 had gone into the proceed position. Then he returned to his desk. A few minutes later, he again heard the first number 86 sound the whistle for signal 40. He got up and checked the interlocking machine again and noted that track indicator 40 and signal 40 were in the correct position, but the latch on signal 40 was not properly seated by about three quarters of an inch, causing the signal itself to seat in the stop position. He at once restored the lever to normal and both indicators went to the clear position. About a minute after he cleared the signal, the annunciator sounded for the 20th Century Limited on track three. He cleared the signal for that train and it passed his tower at around 318. The first indication he received that there was an accident is when a flagman came running toward the tower with a lit fuse in his hand. So that's what the Interstate Commerce Commission concluded in its report, but newspaper articles and interviews 
paint a different view showing that human error may have been a bigger cause for the crash. Several articles maintain that the towermen got confused, and instead of switching signal 40 to allow the first train to proceed, he inadvertently switched the signal further west, giving the all clear to the second train. This, combined with the second train's failure to slow during low visibility, led to the tragic event that morning. As for the third train, the 20th Century Limited, its high rate of speed was also a contributing factor. There was simply no way for that train to stop in time. You would think that there would be a safety measure in place to require trains to travel at slower speeds when visibility was limited. But the opposite was true. Inexplicably, it was commonplace for trains to make up time in low visibility. All three engineers spoke to those facts in their interviews, and the fact that each train made up time while steaming through the fog would seem to confirm it. Public outcry demanded answers and accountability, but there was none. No fines, no prosecutions. There was a significant overhaul to railroad safety regulations, though. Automatic block signaling systems designed to prevent train-to-train -train collisions were widely implemented reducing the human element that may have led to this disaster. Stricter fog operating procedures were also established, and crew training programs were revamped. But as we've seen from some of our other train videos, this would not be the last of Ohio's train wrecks. In just 24 years, 44 people would die in the head-on collision known as the Doodlebug disaster. While regulations and safety measures were crucial, the human cost of the Amherst train wreck was immeasurable. Survivors carried the physical and emotional scars for the rest of their lives. Families were shattered, and the community grappled with the collective grief and trauma. Even today, the memory of the tragedy lingers in Amherst, a somber reminder of the fragility of life and the importance of safety. If you'd like to learn more about the Amherst train wreck, please make a trip to Sandstone Village in Amherst. A monument to the train crash stands less than 75 feet where the crash occurred, and the walls of the caboose on the property contain a pictorial history of the wreck and its impact on the town. This wonderful village created by the Amherst Historical Society is open to the public year-round. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care.